hello Tunbridge Wells and all the other churches connected to Kent, Sussex and Surrey, that vicinity. Um, my name is Ben Lindsay. I am CEO of a charity called Power to Fight and I'm also author of a book called We Need to Talk About Race, Understanding the Black Experience in White Majority Churches and it's an absolute privilege to be able to speak to you uh, today. Today, I'd like to talk about passion, and I've actually entitled this, this short talk, Be Passionate About Compassion. And I'm going to be reading from very famous verses, uh, Luke 10, uh, verses 25 to 37, the parable of the Good Samaritan. What a year we've had, what a 12 months we've had. We've had a pandemic, a worldwide pandemic, which has impacted us here in the UK. And I appreciate for some of you, you may have um, caught COVID-19. You might have had loved ones who have, who have got COVID-19. You might have had people you know who may have unfortunately passed away from the disease. Um, for some of you, it might have impacted your work and, and your jobs. Uh, it's been devastating to to communities. Also, the other thing which has been in the news is Black Lives Matter, BLM. Three words or three letters, I should say, which basically uh, can cause Christians to twitch a little bit and get a little bit kind of uh, confused and frustrated and sometimes angry about what it means, Black Lives Matter. Um, doesn't all lives matter? This is some of the things that I've, I've, I've heard. Whatever your feelings, whatever your experiences around COVID-19 or even Black Lives Matter, uh, we have to appreciate we're in what we uh, know in, in Greek as a kairos moment. Kairos being an ancient Greek word, the meaning of the word is the right, critical or opportune moment, a proper or opportune moment for action. And I think this is what we are needing to really unpack, what I would like to unpack today. We've, we've, we've seen sports stars take a knee. We've seen black uh, squares on our Instagram. We've recently seen uh, the Premier League decide to come off social media for the weekend to demonstrate and present their solidarity with 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 against racial injustice we've seen lots of what i would call performative allyship things which seem more like symbolism than actual substantial uh, change in action i suppose the question i've got for you is what will our church look like post George Floyd? George Floyd, the murdered black man who had his neck uh, crushed for nine minutes uh, for the world to see. What needs to be re rebuilt? What needs to be knocked down? How can we proactively work for racial justice as we come out of lockdown? I suppose one of the things which, one of the key points I want us to hold on to is that in my opinion, and I think the Bible does teach this, is that Christians are meant to be the leaders in justice. Christians are meant to be the leaders in justice. All justice issues. Where there is injustice, that's where we should be as Christians. If the story of the Good Samaritan teaches us anything, is that sometimes Christians, in the case of the Good Samaritan, it was the priest and the Levite who walked away from the dying man. The dying Jewish man was walked past by the very people who should have been showing justice and support and care. But it was actually the sworn enemy of the Jewish man, the Samaritan. If you know anything about the Jews and Samaritans, you know there was actually a lot of racial hatred between the two yet it was the Samaritan who came and showed the most love and justice and care and mercy 
the question we have to ask ourselves, particularly white Christians, are you walking past your black or brown brother and sister in the context of racial injustice at a time when you can be supportive, helpful, fighting on their behalf? I think it's something about church and justice is quite confusing for some people. But Jesus himself is very clear. His own words um, is very clear about where the church should stand with this issue of fighting for justice. He says it himself in Matthew 23, 23 says this. And you know, Jesus' harshest words tend to be for us as church leaders or religious leaders or as, or as followers of him or who claim to be followers of him. And he says this. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law. Justice, mercy and faithfulness. You should have practice the latter without neglecting the former. So right at the heart of the teaching of Jesus, he is very clear that justice, mercy and faithfulness should be at the heart of anything that we are doing. We have to ask ourselves the question, in today's context, in your context, where are the justice needs? Where are people suffering? And in the last year, the, the, the conversation around Black Lives Matter and racial justice is right at the forefront. And now some of you might be thinking, but well, hold on a minute, I don't know any black people. I don't know your area that well, but from what I picked up, um, there's probably not many black or brown people, maybe even in your church context. But nevertheless, one part of the body is suffering. And as it says in Corinthians, we're all then to get involved, engage and support. If one part of the body suffers, we all suffer. If one part rejoices, we all rejoice. Brian Stevenson, an American lawyer, social active, activist and author of a book called Just Mercy says this, you can't understand the important things from a distance, you have to get close. So how do we fight injustice? How do we fight racial injustice? How do you, in your white majority context, fight against injustice to black and brown people? Well, there's a few things I just wanna go over very quickly, which I hopefully will help you. Um, and the first thing is this, it's about systems. It's about systems. Um, with my charity, Power to Fight, we're very clear that we want to not just engage with the ground war, uh, the ground engagement, which would be very much around youth work, mentoring, pastoral care, youth centers, anywhere where young people are, statutory services like schools. We know that's a very, where the majority of youth work um, happens but we're also aware that if that's the ground war we also have to impact the air i'd say that maybe 10 to 20 percent of youth work is also in the air it's the policies it's the strategy it's the decision makers it's the grant funding and the, and, uh, and and you know the financial element of stuff which is going to help actually get that money and those resources into grassroots organizations it's it's local and central government. We work very close, closely with the Mayor of London. We work very closely with the Youth Finance Commission. There's multiple different things that we do on the air and on the ground. You see, the problem that we've got often is that the church, and I'll talk a little bit about this in my book, the church is very good at social welfare. We're good at cap. If somebody is in debt, Christians Against Poverty, we, which is a brilliant service, we sometimes use them or if people are hungry we've got food bank which has fed millions of people none of that's a problem Jesus did that people were hungry he he multiplied bread and fish but what about social justice what about the very institutions or the very the very the the, the, the systems itself which caused the social welfare in in the first place we have to appreciate this is not just about the the, the Christian walk, uh, the love of Christ isn't just about the redemption of us as individuals, our personal relationship, our personal salvation. It's also about the redemption of communities as well. The question I have for you, are you prepared to challenge the systems around you which cause 
this injustice and inequality in the first place. What we have to appreciate when it comes to black and brown people, there are many things which are not just about the individual choices, but the systems. For example, black people are nine to one more likely to be stopped and searched by the police. That's disproportionate. That is an institutional system problem. Black Caribbean boys are more likely to be three to one, more likely to be excluded from schools. That is an institution systems problem. It's a systemic issue. There's four to one more likely black and brown teenagers in the criminal justice system. There's only 7% of us in, in, in London and 3% of us in the UK. So what does that mean? It means there's a system issues. Are you prepared in your context to stand up and fight against the systems which we know can cause injustice and disproportionality? So systems is the first thing. The second thing is also about culture culture if we're going to challenge the systems for uh, which bring injustice and inequality we've also got a um, challenge and become more what i would call culturally competent and contextually competent into the areas that we're dealing with lots of us plant air churches in in areas but don't really understand the history of those areas lots of us want to engage with different cultures but don't necessarily want to do the work are you culturally competent in the context of what you're working in? Are you prepared to engage and learn about the experiences of other cultures so you have a better understanding of engaging and loving your neighbour? You see, when we talk about being passionate about compassion, it means that you do your due diligence, you engage, you talk. Are you prepared to do that? For us, cultural competency at my charity is really important. As an example of this would be that... Uh, very quickly in my experience of working in youth work and youth offending services and community safety teams was that often black and brown young people, families and even practitioners on the front line struggled with therapy. They didn't engage with, with therapy and psychologists and didn't really have clinical supervision. But the main reason was because many of the people who were delivering this were white middle class people. Now, just to be clear, I'm not against white middle class people. But if we are going to engage in this in this issue, I believe, and studies that we've we've put out with the Mayor of London suggest this, that actually, particularly when you're working in, in areas where there's there's a there's racial diversity, we need to become more culturally competent. We're not just advocating for more black and brown professionals in these settings. We're saying that if you are white and in these in these settings, are you culturally competent? Are you do you understand the context that you're working in? I think the same can be done for church. We often go and launch and, and plant, but often we don't understand the culture and the communities that we're, we're, we're working in. So can we, as well as challenging the systems, are we prepared to do the work to really get to understand the culture? We've got to go from just diversity and um, being inclusive uh, to accessibility and making people feel like they belong. And the best way to make people feel like belong, belonging is actually to bring those voices around the table and engage that way. So we've got to impact the systems, we've got to impact the culture. But also we have to appreciate that we also have the ingredients to really make a massive change when it comes to racial injustice or any type of injustice actually. Churches tend to have the things which we no longer have in abundance due to austerity. We've got buildings, buildings, thousands of buildings across the UK um, through the church. We've also got the biggest volunteer service in the UK. We have unrestricted funds from heaven. Um, you know, it's incredible what churches can do when they tithe and they give um, and they, you know, they take up offerings. Somebody who works for a charity, the red tape you have to sometimes go through to get grant funding churches can can cut through that with with the amount of uh, money which is raised for a particular cause but we also have influence and this goes back to the systems thing how many of us as christians engage with our local politicians um how many of us engage in, in with our mps and uh, heads of service and borough commanders and sit on independent advisory groups and safer neighborhood teams it might be different in different areas uh stop and search committees school governors you know, if we, if I said earlier on, if 
three to one black children are more likely to be excluded and you've got a heart and compassion for this why don't you go on a school board and find out what is going on is there something institutionally not quite right in those settings we can do a lot so systems culture and ingredients these are the things that we need to engage with if we really want to see change there's three types of people biblical people we need to be number one we need to be more like esther esther the young jewish queen becomes queen and mordecai mordecai is very concerned about his family, his community being exterminated. And what does he do? He goes to Queen Esther and says, listen, you, for such a time as this, we need your support. Go and talk to the king. So Esther goes and talks to the king and the king helps uh, sort this situation out. Beloved, this is what we have access to. We have access to our king. We have to learn to pray and engage and petition and ask our Father in Heaven to engage in our hearts and our minds and our souls around this issue. For some of us, with the conversation of race is very, very problematic. For some of us, it's about repentance. For so some of us, it's about forgiveness. For some of us, we need provocation to engage. We need to know how to use our agencies. I just want to be really clear. It is a lot safer for white people to speak up about racism than it is for black people. I'll say it again, it's a lot safer for white people to talk about racism, to speak on behalf of black people than it is for black people. Why? Because when black people start talking about racism and talking about their injustices, which is impacts of them, we can often be accused of having a chip on our shoulder, being aggressive, playing the race card. Some of us will be afraid of losing our jobs. Some of us might think, you know what, I might not get asked to lead that connect group or small group. The worst thing that can happen to you as a white person is that you might be told you, you, you got it wrong, but you'll still be okay. And the worst case for a black person, when we look at some of the recent things which have come out around, particularly around police and police brutality, it could end up with us being killed. That's not me exaggerating. That is just the facts. So be Esther, go to the king and arts to be empowered and arts for solutions and get some time with our king on this particular issue we need to be like Gideon first we need to be, be like Esther we also need to be like Gideon we need to be bold enough to step into the arena I love Gideon he's one of my favourite characters in the bible mainly because he was such a scaredy cat and yet he found himself in a situation where God said I need you to take on the Midianites me I'm the weakest in my clan how can I do this through the power of God and he became an advocate for Israel. He spoke up. He had empathy and compassion for the situation. It wasn't performative allyship. It was proper, we're gonna, I'm gonna engage, I'm gonna lead the people. This is my challenge to you, as particularly the white people in, in this context. Are you prepared to stand up? Are you prepared to be advocates? Are you prepared to speak up? Are you prepared to use agency? Are you prepared to put your hands in your pocket and maybe support black-led organizations in your local context? Do you ha are you passionate about compassion? You know, we've seen this performative allyship with, um, that recently, if you're into football, the Super League came up, didn't it? And we saw... Uh, words being used like we need to mobilise and we need to uh, really talk to the owners of the clubs how dare they take six of the top clubs in the UK and try and put them in a, U in a, in a European Super League and the world went mad politicians spoke up pastors and religious leaders spoke up royalty spoke up the energy was there to stop this Super League it's a shame the same thing doesn't happen with racism when this country really wants to get behind something which is unjust everybody's behind it are you prepared to step into the arena and finally we need to be like Jesus our, our Lord and Saviour and there's many attributes and, uh, and characteristics of Jesus I could pull on but one of the things I love is that he's the miracle worker he's the thing who multiplies things I already mentioned about uh, feeding thousands of people with, with small fish and loaves that he had we have to be like Jesus. We take the small things and pray and ask our Father in heaven to multiply. You're, you're weak, you're, you're afraid. Ask God to take you that small 
bit of courage that you've got that boldness and step into the arena because our black brothers and sisters need your voice in this. We need your energy in this. We need your resources. And so, so many people say, well, what can I do? I don't really understand. Well, I guarantee in your church context, at some point you gave money to, to an African nation. Many of you have never been there, but there was something about your heart being tugged that you could support, whether it's through prayers or whether it's through finance or through action. It doesn't matter if you can't relate, but know your brothers and sisters in Christ who may well be a different skin color need you and I get it some of us have got different perspectives on what that is some of us say I, I see no colour you know it's interesting when people say that I get it it comes from a good place but God clearly did see colour when he made me when he made you you know our identity is in Christ but he's made us in this different kind of mix of, of, of cultures and backgrounds and they are to be celebrated as well we can't ignore colour. He didn't make us grey. So, those are the three people. Be Esther, be Gideon, be Jesus. We, we need to challenge the systems. We need to challenge the culture. We need to challenge and appreciate the ingredients that we've got. The, the Good Samaritan story is, is a, should be a warning that if we do not show compassion, if we do not engage where there's injustice, God will raise up other people. And they may not be of faith. I think the Black Lives Matter organisation is possibly a good example of this. So many people say to me, I'm not down with Black Lives Matter, the organisation. You know, yeah, it's a political organisation. They're Marxists, they're all this type of stuff. Whether I believe that's true or not is irrelevant. The point is this. I find it interesting that as the church and as Christians that we are quick to challenge organisations trying to do justice, even if it's not quite our, very, our, our version of biblical justice. Because the thing is this, where were we? If we don't step into the arena, like the priest and the Levite, they walk past the guy, then a Samaritan will come. And other people have stepped in. And instead of us showing our version of biblical justice, we moan and we groan and we don't do anything. The Good Samaritans are warning against this. You can't understand the important things from a distance. You have to get close. As John Piper says, we are to get low and get and get our hands dirty. He says, uh, this guy called Pastor Doug Logan who leads a church in America, he says this, mission does not simply amount to a profession of theological truths in new contexts. We cannot hope for more for mere intellectual salvation of community members, abstractly hoping that they will hear our speeches and come to Christ. Instead, we must enter into communities physically and emotionally. We must enter into the suffering, into their suffering, and speak the gospel into the individual broken context. We cannot effectively serve broken people and bring them the gospel unless we know their brokenness. Do you know? the brokenness of black and brown people right now are you prepared to step into the arena of the brokenness of black and brown people the good samaritan is also a story of the great samaritan jesus christ stepping off the throne stepping into the brokenness of humankind to save us and reconcile our relationship with with our father in heaven god never does anything that uh, he never expects us to do anything that he hasn't done already are we prepared to step in are we passionate about compassion there are broken black and brown people and there have been broken black and brown people for generations. The church needs to step up right now. You shall love the Lord God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbour as yourself. Jesus didn't ignore us. Let's not ignore our black and brown neighbours right now. Jesus is passionate about compassion. If you're a Christian here, you know that. He was passionate about you. He died on the cross for you. He was resurrected for you. And we are to imitate him in our context. Who is your neighbour? Everyone. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbour to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Show mercy now. Step into the arena. Choose hope in a dark situation Heavenly Father I thank you for this time I pray that uh, these words have inspired given hope equipped but more than anything shown 
you, Jesus Christ, in the heart of this issue around Black Lives Matter and, and injustice. We need you, we need you, Spirit, to help us, but we also know that a lot of this is in our hands. God, let us be the answer or part of the solution to this problem of racism, whether that's systemic, whether that's covert or over institutional, we know it exists. We know the situation. Now give us the boldness to step in. In your mighty name, amen. Thank you for your time. God bless. Mm.